Welcome to our series entitled, 30 Questions Asked in the Old Testament. In our 30-day series, we will be examining questions that are asked in the Old Testament. These are not questions that we have asked, but questions that are actually stated in the text. Some are asked by individuals, like today's question, and many are asked by God within the text of the Old Testament. Today's question is from Job chapter 14, verse 15. If a man dies, shall he live again? I'll be reading from the book of Job chapter 14. We'll read it in its entirety to give us a context of what he is asking. Man who is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. He comes out like a flower and withers. He flees like a shadow and continues not. And do you open your eyes on such a one and bring me into judgment with you? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? There is not one. Since his days are determined and the number of his months is with you, and you have appointed his limits that he cannot pass, look away from him and leave him alone, that he may enjoy like a hired hand his day. For there is hope for a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its shoots will not cease. Though its roots grow old in the earth and its stump die in the soil, yet at the scent of water it will bud and put out branches like a young plant. But a man dies and is laid low. Man breathes his last, and where is he? As waters fail from a lake and a river wastes away and dries up, so a man lies down and rises not again, till the heavens are no more. He will not awake or be roused out of his sleep. Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol, that you would conceal me until your wrath be past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my service I would wait till my renewal could come. You would call, and I would answer you. You would long for the work of your hands, for then you would number my steps. You would not keep watch over my sin, my transgression would be sealed up in a bag, and you would cover over my iniquity. But the mountain falls and crumbles away, and the rock is removed from its place. The waters wear away the stones, the torrents wash away the soil of the earth. So you destroy the hope of man. You prevail forever against him, and he passes. You change his countenance and send him away. His sons come to honor, and he does not know it. They are brought low, and he perceives it not. He feels only the pain of his own body, and he mourns only for himself. I've begun in the book of Job, having considered that this book is thought to be the oldest book in the Bible, and supposed to have been written by Moses. The book of Job has, by my count, 351 questions. There are questions asked by Satan, by Job's wife, by Job's friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and by the younger Elihu. God himself asked clearly one-fourth of the questions. But by far, the majority of questions are asked by Job. Some of the most challenging questions that can be posed are found here in Job. Yet the question we shall be addressing today is one that has puzzled, challenged, and haunted man since the first blood was spilled and the breath ceased in Abel. What happens to man after death? Will he live again? The Egyptians loaded the tombs of the pharaohs for the next life. Eastern religions teach of reincarnation in which humans continue to come back until they, so to speak, get it right. I know that is oversimplifying the concept. Some cultures believe that the spirit of the deceased one lingers and guides loved ones. Time and space won't allow to look at the many, many ideas of our world today of what happens after death and if there is an afterlife. But since this is a question asked in the Bible, we shall consider it in the context of the Bible. The short answer is yes. If a person dies, they will live again. There are many, many stories of people who believe that they were alive in the past in another person. Did you ever notice how they are usually famous or of royalty? Some have claims of dying and going to heaven and coming back to tell the story. Again, 
too many to recount. But this question isn't about near-death experiences. It is about the finality of this life and what awaits after. The most concise answer given was by Jesus. Since He was the Son of God and God in the flesh, then we shall consider Him to be the final word on the subject. Jesus is questioned by the Sadducees, a sect of Jews in the first century that did not believe in the resurrection, among other things. When they question Jesus about this, this is His response. We read in Luke chapter 20, verses 37 and 38. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Jesus again answers the Pharisees succinctly about the two destinies of those who will be resurrected. In John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, he tells us, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear His voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. But this is not just a New Testament idea. Hear what Daniel proclaimed in his Old Testament book. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame, and everlasting contempt. Since Jesus is the final authority on the most important questions that can be asked, wouldn't it be wise to see what He says one must do to inherit eternal life? Question number two we find in the book of Job, chapter 38. We'll read the entirety of chapter 38 to give a context to the question we're going to be asked today. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it, set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of the deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light, and where is the place of darkness, that you may take it to its territory, that you may discern the paths to its home? You know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow, or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? What is the way to the place where the light is distributed, or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Who has cleft the channel for the torrents of rain, and a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land where no man is, on the desert in which there is no man, to satisfy the waste and desolate land, to make the ground sprout with grass? Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew, from whom the Womb did the ice come forth, and who has given birth to the frost of heaven? The waters become hard like stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades, or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season? Or can you guide the bear with its children? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that a flood of waters may cover you? 
Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, Here we are. Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who can number the clouds by wisdom? Or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs in a mass and clods stick fast together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their thicket? Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God for help and wander about for lack of food? Our question for the day is, from Job 38, verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Over the years, I have listened to many people ponder those questions they will ask when they get to heaven. They really boil down to the mysteries here on earth. They range from things concerning biblical topics. What happened here? Or where was so-and-so? They wonder if their pets are there. They wonder why things happen to them on earth. They wonder why things were allowed to happen here. Those how come questions. Some would want to know how God did all that he did in creation and continuing. No doubt the same questions most people want to know. There are the curiosity questions and then there are the accusatory questions. As if we are going to interrogate God and put him on the stand and answer for all that he did or didn't do. That's the sense I get from this stream of nearly 100 questions God asks of Job. After listening to Job and all that he and others had to say on the subject of the meaning of life, God makes his appearance, so to speak, to Job. Instead of giving Job the answers to life, he proceeds to ask him questions. Notice God begins in verses 2 and 3, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. It is rather like a child being called into the principal's office. You know you're in trouble and you're in for a lecture. When you look back at the dizzying amount of questions and accusations and suppositions thrown around by this time, one thing that you might remember is that Job actually wanted this moment with God. Turn back to Job 13, verses 20 and 22, and you read, Only grant me two things, then I will not hide myself from your face. Withdraw your hand far from me, and let me not dread of your terrified. Then call, and I will answer. Or let me speak, and you reply to me. And again in Job 31, 35. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. Oh, that I had the indictment written by my adversary. We sometimes refer to this as, Be careful what you ask for. You just might get it. One can only imagine the scene as the Lord answers Job out of the whirlwind. One would think that this alone would make anyone listening aware of the awe and majesty of the one on high. In all of Job's talk, and Job, Job does most of it in this book, his words did not clarify or rightly represent the Lord, but darkened or made cloudy God's omniscient ways. Now the Lord will demand of Job some answers. I can only imagine what Job must have thought when he was commanded, Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. The very first question asked, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Settles the discussion. The next 90 or so questions prove that Job had not the vision, wisdom, or insight of understanding required to organize and create a universe. In the same way that an adolescent may chide their parents for decisions they make, God shows Job over and over his inability to grasp just how complex this world is and thereby understand that the Lord is in complete control. I wonder if I will remember this question the next time 
I have a question about how God is handling the world. Question number three we find in the book of Genesis, chapter three. We'll read the entire chapter to give a context of the question asked. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig trees together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock, and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return." The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins, and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand, and take also of the tree of life and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden, to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Our question for today is that which the devil, by the agency of the serpent, asked. Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? If you're keeping track, this is the first question recorded in the Bible. This chapter in the Bible has been examined in volumes of works over the centuries, so suffice it to say that within the time and space allotted here, we shall not endeavor to explore every aspect of this, only to consider the implications of what the object and purpose was of posing such a question. To start, let's actually fast forward some 4,000 years to a statement Paul makes in his letter to the church at Corinth. In 2 Corinthians 11.3, Paul says, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. This gives an historical context and not one of allegory or myth, so to speak, and Paul affirms by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that this did in fact occur. 
Jesus too affirms as much when he says in John 8, 44, You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. It is safe to say that the purpose of this question is not to confirm something that Satan had wanted to know or to make sure that Eve understood. Satan's intent was to deceive. Deception, temptation, and sin often lurk in the shadow of half-truths and almost-sos. Eve's response has puzzled many over the centuries and sparked not a few debates as to what she meant. However, the Apostle Paul clarifies some of the confusion in that he tells us that Satan deceived Eve. What's more, Paul desires those in Corinth to have a simplicity and a pure devotion to Christ. That gives us some insight into God's command. His command was simple and not as complicated as Satan's cunning deception led her to believe. Satan challenges Eve on the point that she won't die, and God's intention all along is to deny her to be godlike and knowing good from evil. He further appeals to the big three when he dangles the temptations that will haunt all mankind. The Apostle John identifies these in 1 John 2.16. He says that number one is the lust of the flesh. Eve saw it and it was good for food. Number two is the lust of the eyes. Eve thought it was a delight to the eyes. And number three, the boastful pride of life. The tree was desirable to make one wise. You might want to read Matthew chapter 4 and compare the tactics Satan used to tempt Jesus and see if you notice a pattern. So what was it in the question that was so devastating? We have the advantage of reflecting upon this situation, something Eve did not have prior to this the subtlety of planting the seeds of doubt. Did God? Perhaps it is worth noting that Satan does not say Lord God, the expression of a covenant relationship, but merely God, the Hebrew word Elohim. I rather like the New American Standard Version's rendering, Indeed, has God said? An astonishment that God should deny this. The moment Eve opens her mouth to answer, the hook is set, as they say in the language of anglers. One is reminded of the warning Solomon gives in Proverbs 26.4. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest he be like him yourself. We may long speculate that scene in the garden and wonder at the myriads of minutia to be pondered upon. Yet one thing is paramount to remember. The question of deceivers are so often laced with the poison of doubts and insinuations. But we would never fall for that old trick, now would we? Our question for today is, is anything too hard for the Lord? From Genesis 18:14. To give us a context of this question, we'll be reading verses 1 through 16. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and bowed himself to the earth, and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, while I bring a morsel of bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, Quick, three seahs of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, She is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. 
Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you. About this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, No, but you did laugh. Then the men set out from there, and they looked down towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. Our question in verse 14, Is anything too hard for the Lord? I preached a sermon in the past and have heard lessons on the topic of things God cannot do. The first thought we may have is, God is omnipotent and omniscient and every other omni. There's nothing He can't do. But a closer look reveals that there are indeed some things He cannot do. Not because it is so monumental or hard for Him, but because it is against His very nature. For example, God cannot lie, Hebrews 6.18. God cannot change, James 1.17 and Malachi 3.6. God cannot sin, John 1.5 and Numbers 23.19. God cannot make a mistake, Deuteronomy 32.4. God cannot be tempted by evil, James 1.13. And God cannot be deceived, Hebrews 4.13, among others. Some may pose the question, Can God create a rock big enough that even He can't move it? Aha! Busted! There is no God. Well, not so fast, Philosophy 101 student. You seek something that is self-contradictory and incoherent. It is as if to say, can God create a round square or a five-sided triangle? But enough of those absurdities. God poses this question to Abraham in response to Sarah's laughing in disbelief at the thought of having a child at her age. We, being some four millennia removed and knowing how things turn out, seem rather sure of ourselves and wondering why both should be doubting. We may seem to be like spectators shouting from the sidelines, Abraham, you're talking to God Almighty. Believe Him when He tells you this. Well, not so fast, Religion 101 students. After all these millennia and having the written word, why is it that we are slow to believe that there is nothing too hard for God. Just to bolster the case of God's ability to do hard things, you might want to read Genesis chapter 1 or Job chapters 38 through 41. I think a pretty good case could be made for there outside Abraham's tent. Let's come back to our current century and place ourselves in the position of the one who is presented with a challenge spiritually. Let's start with the nearly impossible task of finding someone who will believe the story of Jesus' resurrection. Can I find just one person who will listen? Can I get somebody to at least open the door to start a conversation? Impossible, you say? How about praying in faith when we ask God for opportunities, and then living our daily lives with the expectation that it will happen? Consider what Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, verses 22 through 24. Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. I'm of the mindset that God is not in the let me show you some really cool stuff business any longer, like moving mountains and withering fig trees. It's not that He can't do it, but I rather think that He is really more interested in the souls of people and the saving of them. So when we are praying for opportunities to share our faith and we ask God with a certain incredulous or doubting that it can be done attitude, can't you almost hear that question being posed to us? Is anything too hard for the Lord? 
Are you asking in faith? Our question number five for today comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 20. What is the meaning of these testimony statutes and rules that the Lord our God has commanded? To give us context of this question, we'll be reading the entirety of Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, all the days of your life that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of, of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. When the Lord our God brings you into the land that He swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you, with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by His name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and He destroy you from off the face of the earth. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test, as you tested Him at Massah. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, and His testimony, and His statutes, which He has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord that it may go well with you, and that you may go in and take possession of the good land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers, by thrusting out all your enemies from before you, as the Lord has promised. When your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and statutes and rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, We were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and grievous against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us up out of there, that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all His commandments before the Lord our God as He has commanded us. Our question to consider today, when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of these testimonies and statutes and rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Some of you may remember a regular segment from a popular TV show from long ago called Kids Say the Darndest Things, hosted by Art Linkletter. It has been revived of late and is still as funny as ever. Inferred in the title is the fact that kids have some rather wild responses when given almost any topic to speak on. It comes from a rather innocence of life and having only seen a limited things up to that time. Children are inquisitive by nature. Many a parent will tell you of endless questions they have fielded by the curious toddlers. All of the world seems new and they have an interest in knowing how and why it works. It is this desire to learn that God, through Moses, presses upon Israel to have a response when asked, what is the meaning of these things? Notice that the response to this isn't because I said so, or because God said so. 
the answer to this comes from an eyewitness account of what happened. Remember, this is given to the children who were 20 and under when they came out of Egypt. All of those 20 and over died in the wilderness, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb. The wonder of these events through the eyes of young people will be worthy of witnessing to the children who will follow. Can you imagine children growing up hearing these stories? There's an added bonus beyond the fact that they had seen this. There is the promise given that if they follow these testimonies, statutes and rules, that God shall bless them and do all that is good and preserve life. These words that Moses gave to them were to be constantly on the lips of parents to teach their children. They were to teach them diligently. Everywhere they looked, these teachings were to be seen on doorposts and gates and clothes. When they sat down, when they walked, when they lay down, they were to be talking about them. What is it that we are to do today when it comes to passing God's Word down to our children? Is it enough to leave it to the Bible classes and the assembly or preacher sermons? I think the answer is plain here. We do well when we model our teaching after this passage. After all, that's how young Timothy learned that Paul told us. Have you been diligent in teaching your children the Word of God? And Lord willing, let's meet here again tomorrow and look at more questions from the Old Testament.